Please have everyone's attention. Before the meeting begin, we ask that everyone please silence your cell phones. The Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustee meeting is an open meeting for the public to observe the board conducting district business. Therefore, patrons may only address the board during the designated audience item section on the agenda. If you have printed materials you want to give to board members, you must provide them to me or any officer present and we will provide them to the board. We also ask that members of the audience be respectful of others by maintaining quiet so that everyone is able to hear the proceedings. Thank you. The time is now 6.03 p.m. and this meeting is hereby called to order. We have the presence of a quorum attending in person. Notice of this meeting has been posted online and at the Fort Bend ISD administration building for at least 72 hours. Welcome to the June 20th meeting of the Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustees. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that yesterday was Juneteenth, a very important day for us here in, in Texas and now a federal holiday. I hope everyone had a chance to observe Juneteenth and participate in many of the outstanding events throughout our community. We will now have the national anthem. Thank you very much for sharing your beautiful voices. We will now have a moment of silence. Thank you. And the board will know, we'll, we will now go down for recognitions, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Veronica Sofer. Thank you. Madam President, superintendent, members of the board, we've got outstanding group of recognition this evening, and I'm first going to ask Mr. Eugene Holkup, assistant director of fine arts, to f join us and uh, start our first group of recognition. group that's going to uh, be recognized and they are from Fort Settlement Middle School and from First Colony Middle School. 
The first group is the TCDA Elementary Honor Choir students who were selected. Nine students from the Fort Settlement Middle School Choir were selected for the 2022 Elementary Honor Choir through a competitive blind taped audition process from students across the state. The 200 voice choir will be conducted by recognized choral clinician, Dr. Angela Casper from Western Washington University. And these students, from Fort Settlement Middle School, Kristen Jordan, conductor. Those students are Avni Agarwal, Riddhi Mehta, and Zaina Basaria. And the students selected for the TCDA Middle School Junior High All-State Choir, six students from First Colony Middle School and nine students from Fort Settlement Middle School Choir were selected for the 2022 TCDA Middle School Junior High All-State Choir through a competitive blind taped audition process from students across the state. The 200 voice choir will be conducted by world-renowned choral clinician, Dr. Jeffrey Redding, artistic director of the Garden Community Choir in Winter Garden, Florida. And the students from Fort Settlement Middle School, conducted by Kirsten Jordan, Joanna Varghese, Christy Sun, Sarah Gentle, Noah Zane, and from First Colony Middle School, Tommy Trin, Director and Joshua Sarmiento, Assistant Director, Chris Jacob, William Jordan, Leon Pardo, Carla Zapata, and Paul Ziamek. <laughs> and if all the students will gather in the center for a picture with the directors and the board. Smiles, three, two, one. One more. Three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have outstanding fine arts students in Fort Bend ISD. Much to celebrate. Next, we have Madden Elementary School Student Council. They won two prestigious awards this school year, the Texas Elementary Principals and Supervisors Association, TAPSA, Student Leadership Award for their outstanding student leadership and their impact on the school community, as well as winning the National Association of Elementary School American Student Council Association Excellence Award, and they did outstand for their astounding, outstanding achievements in community service, student leadership, and citizen and school Spirit. So, representing Madden tonight, I'd like to invite the Vice President, Sumira Choku, uh, Secretary Duroy Sai, Treasurer Sophia Chaku, Historian Jacqueline Taylor, and their outstanding Student Council sponsor, Hannah Hammond. Congratulations to Madden Elementary. Next, from Austin High School, I'd like to invite up Ananya 
Golkol, who was a junior there at Austin High School, and she received the 2021-22 National Community Service Award Ambassador from the United Nations Association of the USA for her efforts in community service. Fantastic job representing Austin High School. Now I'd like to please ask Trey Samuel from the Reese Career and Techn Technological Center to come up to present our next few recognitions. Very excited about these. I'll turn it over to Trey. High Tower High School health science students participated and excelled in the HOSA Future Health Professional State Competition. The following students placed in this competition. Aman Chaudhry, Arshi Manyar, Mohit Kaneri, Jude Chitet, Bilvanilai Vakula Burnham, Jivana Gadipati, Rebecca Joji, Irene Johns, Arish Ali, Mayank Shaker, and Mahir Shaker. And the HOSA leader is Joe Ayala. Thank you, Trey, and congratulations to our students. They represented us very well. Next, from Dulles High School, I'd like to introduce Anvi Gareli, was a recipient of the 2022 Student Heroes Award from the State Board of Education District 4 for her acts of kindness, charity, and selfless service offered towards others. Congratulations. <laughs> We have a trend, Mr. Sh yeah, Mr. Stewart. There he is. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for representing Dulles so well. Next, I'd like to ask Shannon Rideout, Assistant Director of Athletics, to join us at the podium and announce our recognition for athletics. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. Today we would like to recognize Marshall Girls Track and Field Team. They claim the overall 5A championship team title for UIL Track and Field State Meet. This is their second consecutive team championship. So again, congratulations to the Marshall Buffaloes. With that, we'd like to recognize Brianna Brinkley, Brittany Green, Genesis Griffin, Tyra Johnson, Tyler Moore, Desiree Roberts, Cecily Williams, and Janai Williams. Coach by Coach Anhumwa, Coach Wilson, and Coach Cross.
to work. Next, we'd like to congratulate the Marshall Boys track and field team. They've claimed the overall 5A championship title in UIL State Track and Field. This is the program's fifth team championship in, five, in actually in seven years, their fifth title in seven years. So again, congratulations, starting off with Chris Brinkley, Arvion Davis, Jonathan Howard, Michael Patterson, Mason Rose Barrow, coached by Coach Alex, and head coach, Coach Banks. Next, we would like to congratulate the Bush Girls 4x100 meter relay team. They place first in the 6A division for girls track and field in the UIL state track and field meet. With that, Raylynn Russell, member of the team, Rachel Joseph, Christina Pleasant, Yamarie Hardeman, coached by Coach Stewart and Coach Jules. That concludes our report for today. Congratulations to all of our students. All right, that was awesome. Thank you for the recognitions, Veronica Sofer. <laughs> there are four speakers. The board encourages. Oh, it doesn't say that here. It doesn't say it here. Is it okay? Okay. So we'll move it out. Do that because it is work. Is it on?
Okay. The board encourages and welcomes comments and input from our patrons. Please limit your comments to three minutes and please refrain from mentioning a student or employee's name when voicing a concern or complaint as board policy provides alternative procedures through the grievance process policies GF local or DGBA local to seek resolution to complaints. There are four speakers tonight. And our first speaker is Congressman Pete Olson. First of all, congratulations, Rick and David. You've just won a seat on the most important, best school board in America. Congratulations. And thank you all for letting me speak on a very important issue. We all know that our kids and their parents are the heart and soul of this school district. We all know we have 54 schools named elementary schools all across the district. Only two of those schools are named after former students. Ann Sullivan opened up in 2016, and a couple weeks ago, Melissa Ferguson, online 2023. Those names of students was a big step forward. I'm here to ask you to take another big step forward. By naming the next elementary school, number 55, in Harvest Green after a deserving Forbin ISD mother, Lisa Tory Smith. On October 19th of 2017, Lisa's walking with her six year old son Logan to go to Jan Schiff Elementary School. They were both run over in a crosswalk one block from Schiff. Logan was severely injured. People that see Kevin, heard Logan keep saying, please, don't let my mommy die. Please, don't let my mommy die. Please, don't let my mommy die. Lisa died before sunset. Ironically, Logan's school at Jan Shift was named for my friend, who also was run over crosswalk in Sugarland on January 5th of 2008. I strongly believe that Lisa Tory Smith deserves the honor of being the first Fort Bend parent to have a school named after her. That's going to be inspirational to the students and the parents who are Fort Bend ISD. Lisa Tory Smith Elementary School is a consistent statement that we care. 30 seconds. Even outside the classroom. And since last time I was speaking to you before Independence Day, I've got to talk about a dear friend we all love, our superintendent, Dr. Whitbeck. Chrissy, you know, I have a terrible challenge every year. We both lost our spouses in car crashes on days people are happy and celebrating. We lost Tom on July Time. 4th, Independence Day of 2006. I lost Ellen on April Fool's Day, April 1st of 1990. I say this because to let you know we love you, we've got your back. In 14 days, we'll be there for you every single day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Miss Stephanie Brown. Okay, we'll come back to Miss Brown. Mr. John Fletcher. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here this, today. Uh, and, and I just came over to talk to you in behalf of the Marshall ISD School uh, and what's going on with the 
early college program. Well, not the earliest college program, but, but, but because of the early college program, we have block scheduling. And now I hear the block is going to be modified in a way where uh, they'll be only on block on Tuesday, Thursday, but they'll be on eight, that's, that's four classes. And on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they'll be in eight classes. So it'll be a 45-minute class on Monday, on Mondays through Friday, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and then a 90-minute class on Tuesday, Thursday, which will be four classes. And they would call themselves Tweaking. And I asked the principal, we talked about it in depth, um, and she said it's for the sake of uh, kids who are absent. It takes harder for them to get caught up with their classes. And because of COVID and all that, when they miss, they miss a lot of time. So I, I was concerned because it affects the early college program at Marshall. I'm not here to talk about what goes on at Willow Ridge or what goes on at Hightower. In fact, it's quite offensive when decisions are made and we're all grouped together in one category. When the decision is made, you, we, the district normally puts Hightower, Marshall, and Willow Ridge in one fix-all. And we're different people. We're different communities. We're different agendas and all that, and it's offensive when we get lumped into one uh, because of attendance. But throughout the district, attendance was low. I asked her how, what percentage rate or, or our school is, it's about 95% absenteeism. But that's overall the scale, all the district. But yet to fix that absenteeism problem, you're tweaking the uh, block scheduling. But other schools have the same problems of absenteeism, but yet, with the absenteeism, their classes are online, not classes online, but the, all the information or homework is put online. Kids have computers, they can stay caught up. They can, they can do the work to be caught up. So I don't see the problem in getting caught up. But because we're early college and we're following the HCC's guidelines and classes, I think that this will hurt. All I'm asking is with uh, maybe Dr. Whitbeck, can we, could you maybe meet with the Marshall Advocacy Focus Group and just let us have a conversation, let's talk. I haven't met with you yet, or our group haven't met with you yet. I know you're very busy, and, and to say the least. But we would like to just sit and talk with, with, with everyone, just to let them know what's going on, how we see things, uh, and Tom, we can see things the way you 30 seconds. But it's, it's, it's very important that we communicate, that we speak only of what's going on in Marshall, how can we make it better for our students. Uh, and not only that, but not only am I advocating for our students, but I'm advocating for all the students within our community. There are kids who are in sixth grade, eighth grade, middle school who are going to be going to Marshall. I'm already advocating for them for already college, so I just want to make sure we get together and just come up with a better plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Miss Stephanie Brown. Hi. Thank you for having me today. My name is Stephanie Brown, and I want to welcome all of you because uh, this is my first time really speaking since we've gotten all the new board members, administration, thank you. Um, but I'm here to talk about, I wanted to talk about something that um, Mr. Fletcher touched on. I was at the last board meeting, and I too was a little upset with the fact that all three schools always get lumped together. And there are different things going on at all three different schools. And this has been a habit for some time now. And not only does that happen, but when we come to a point where you have to make budget cuts or decide whether you're going to take something away from one, you take it away from all. And so we want to just uh, clarify that we are, like he said, three different communities. We have our own needs and we're doing different things. They have P-TECH at their schools. We have early college, which I don't know, I don't have a kid in the program, but they probably are run differently. So we want you to take a look at us as individuals. The budget cuts, when you get ready to do the budget, it should not just come from those schools where you can find monies in their early literacy or the, um, the early college program. And so by saying that, I wanna to touch on their early literacy because we've only had it for one year. And when the Marshall Advocacy Focus Group advocated for this, we were told no about three times, but we kept knocking at the door asking. And they finally, together with Dr. Rodriguez, who so graciously took us under his wing and we worked with him for two and a half years to advocate for so many great things that we are still pending some of those things that we are owed by the district. But I won't go into that and we'll talk to Dr. Whitbeck about that when we meet with her. But the ELC, when it first got started, it was a struggle 
because um, the advocacy focus group helped um, market the program. We actually went out to Juneteenth festivals with T-shirts on advocating to get parents to put their kids in this program. Marketing is a lot better now because you've got uh, stuff on the internet, on television, it's just blown up. And now there are five or six more uh, pre-Ks throughout the district on the other side. Now this is something that we advocated for to have early literacy at all of our pre uh, uh, campuses for elementary. Why? Seconds. Because there were gaps in education pre-COVID. And I understand that there are gaps now, but we need to work on the gaps that were there before. And we wanted to start from the foundation, which is elementary, so there won't be any problems when they get in middle and high school. There's so much more than I could say, but we have more to worry about than masks, what's going to be on the bookshelves, and vaccines. It precludes everything that happened during COVID. And we want you guys to take a look back at what the plans right. were when we collaborated with Dr. Rodriguez. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Brown. Elena Fletcher. Hi. Hi, I'm a student at Thurgood Marshall High School and in the early college program. And I'd like to talk to you about the block scheduling arrangements y'all have currently. Um, so for students that are falling behind due to it, now, okay, so as mentioned before, almost all assignments are on computers, so we can really do them anywhere, anytime. And I don't, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think, it's a lot of my mind. So, and there have I, have, I have heard complaints in my own school about block scheduling, but it came from students, and they've just said it's because they don't want to be in a class for an hour because they don't like the topic or the whoever's in charge of the class. So there have been complaints, but the, the, the reasons for it are not relevant for why there should be a change in, in the block scheduling. As for attendance, uh, I wouldn't blame the block scheduling arrangement for the attendance because students, I admit, will skip regardless, no matter what there is. But block scheduling helps me personally because not only does HCC require my courses to be like an hour and 30 minutes long, but because if there's time at the end of the class after we have learned everything for that plan of the day, I can use the extra time to do homework or other things in that free period that I have. So that way, my other, other things I have to do for that day or the week, it's more time for me to add in things if I have to. It makes it easy for me because I also do a sport. So I have more time in practice and not stress about work or anything. So I feel like it'll make my schedule more flexible. So block scheduling, I feel like, is important and is needed. Thank you, Ms. Fletcher. I will now turn it over to Dr. Whitbeck for opening comments. Well, good evening. Uh, just wanted to um, say happy Juneteenth uh, to our community. Also wanted to just um, make um, perhaps a, a statement with regards to the calendar, uh, that the calendar that we are living now in the summer of 2022 was approved um, well over a year ago, probably winter. Uh, of a year and a half ago. And so we're living through that calendar. I did want to make everyone know that we are going to be looking at that for possible adjustments uh, for the following summer. We know that this affects our more year-long employees and our summer school. So just know and expect that we will be doing that. Uh, the main part of my update is just to share a few great things. A couple of them uh, were, st were students we just recognized, but I want to give you a little bit uh, more information. As you can see, there is senior uh, Anvi Garielli, who has won the State Board of Education District 4 Student Hero Award. She's a senior at the Mass Science Academy at Dulles. And she founded a nonprofit that teaches everyone from teens to senior citizens about mindfulness, mental health, and coping strategies. Uh, you can see Sugarland Mayor Joe Zimmerman, Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition CEO Lisa Pointer, and State Board of Education member Lawrence Allen Jr. were here in the boardroom to celebrate Anvi with us. 
exciting news. And Girls Save the World Challenge. I want to congratulate Travis High School student Meha Amirlingham. Uh, for being one of 10 finalists in HP's Girls Save the World Challenge. She was selected from 800 applicants in 148 countries. Uh, recently, they chose a 16-year-old from Illinois as the winner, but Meha's invention, which takes used shower water and redirects it to flush toilets, continues to receive attention from people in areas where water is at a premium. She's installed her own system at her house, and even her dad is saying the water bill has gone down. So we are proud of students like Meha who are thinking out of the box and making a difference in our world. Uh, next is a Shark Tank style competition. Our district has a team of young entrepreneurs that has advanced to the national pitch quarterfinals. They're competing for the chance to pitch their business idea to a Shark Tank-like group of investors. The team developed an online mentorship service called Easy Apply that connects high school students with college students who will help them with the application process. These amazing students are enrolled in our district's International Business and Marketing Academy. And now some different students and their friends. When we had move-in day at the new Ag Barn, the new Ronnie Davis Agriculture Center is open, and recently the animals have moved in. The barn is state-of-the-art. It's located next to Marshall High School, and it was funded by the 2018 bond. So welcome to our new friends there in Fort Bend ISD. And Noe Doe, you may recognize his name. He's Kempner freshman uh, who won state 5A tennis, but he's just picked up a new title. Noe is the Vibe Magazine Men's Tennis Player of the Year. He's an outstanding young man who excels on the court and in the classroom. Rich Point Baseball, lastly, and uh, certainly not least, uh, we want to congratulate the team for an amazing run this year. They made it all the way to the 6A's state semifinals game with South Lake Carroll before their season ended on Friday, June 10th. Uh, I was there. I know uh, Mr. Hamilton was there, uh, several members of the E-team uh, in the stands cheering and uh, cheering our heads off in Round Rock, Texas. It was extremely hot, but we are so proud of Ridgepoint Baseball. So as we close out our year with students, we just uh, cannot stop enough to say how amazing they truly are, how blessed we are to work with them each and every day. Thank you, Dr. Whitbeck. It's always fun hearing what you've got to say on your re report and update. We will now have um, the activity report with Dr. Gilliam. And good evening, your board at work. These are the events that we have uh, attended in the past month. Dulles FFA Banquet, Student Leadership Breakfast, one-on-one -on -one meetings with our superintendent, Emergent Bilinguals event, SHAC meeting, Policy Committee meetings, Bush High School, One Act Play, we are proud to present, Mission Bend Elementary Multicultural Event, Visit to Marshall High School, Bond Planning Meeting, 2022 Project Search Graduation, FBISD Sugarland 95 Community Engagement, and Sullivan Elementary fifth grade award ceremony, Hightower end of year celebration, FBISD class of 2022 high school graduations, new board member orientation, cybersecurity training, policy subcommittee meeting, board training sessions, school finance 101 meetings, Fort Bend County State of the County event, Fort Bend County 2022 State of Higher Education, TASB Summer Leaders Institute, Ridgepoint High School Baseball Finals and the Playoffs, and Men for Change Scholarship Award Dinner. Thank you. That is your board at work for you. Do we have any special reports? Okay. Seeing no special reports, we'll move on to information items for tonight's meeting. The first information item is student engagement survey presentation. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Malone. Thank you, Dr. Whitbeck, board members. So this evening, we're pleased to provide 
an overview, pretty much a high-level overview of the student engagement survey data, and shortly I'll turn it over to Stephanie Williams, our Executive Director in Organizational Development, and Dr. Tiffany Unruh, who will give you that high-level overview and provide this very important data to you. I think one of the most important things I want us all to know as we kick off this presentation is that um, this data is helping to inform our improvement planning, and it makes us ask, as I know it has made you all ask, and the community as well, many questions as data does. And so the next steps in this process will be to include what we have found through the engagement survey in comparison to past data within the campus improvement planning process and the district improvement planning process. And just um, an update for the community or a reminder to the community that the board will be reviewing those um, performance objectives for the campus plans and the district plan in our September board meeting. So we'll be asking you to review and consider then. And what you'll see is actions associated with some of the needs that this data shows at both the campus, at both the district level and in those campus plans as well. So I wanted to set that for you because I know we have been excited by this data and um, really engaged around, okay, now what? So what, what do we do with this data moving forward so that we can um, make a difference, make an impact in what we see in the coming year? So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Stephanie. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Beth. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, we're currently waiting on the PowerPoint to be put up. Would you like me to start or would you like me to wait? They're looking for it right now. Okay. So that was my question. How far is it having to travel? I think mm -hmm. um, the board's pleasure. May she continue moving forward? And we'll rock and roll. Okay. All right. So good evening. Um, tonight we'll be providing an overview of the student engagement survey. We'll start with an introduction to the student engagement survey, including the purpose, the history, the components of student engagement in Fort Bend ISD. And then um, Dr. Tiffany Unruh will provide an update on the secondary survey results and the elementary survey results. In each of the updates, uh, she will start with the overall dimension scoring. So you'll be looking at a mean and you'll see either a percent of increase or decrease. Then she'll go into each dimension individually and look at the highlights around and look at the highlights from what our students said directly in their responses, and she'll summarize each of the reports by giving you an overview of additional um, information that we gathered from the survey. So again, it'll be the secondary, then the elementary, and we'll close with, thank you, we'll close with next steps um, for the staff. So I'll get us started off um, with a little bit of history on the student engagement survey. Back in um, spring of 2021, one of our board members um, asked us how we were getting input from students. Where was the student voice in our work? At that time, we went to work exploring student engagement surveys and how other districts were engaging students regarding their learner experiences. We were able to identify um, a nationally normed survey from the University of Indiana. That survey is um, the high school survey of student engagement and the middle school survey of student engagement. Through identification of that survey, um, we, identi we uh, launched the first student engagement survey in the spring of 2021. And this spring, we followed up with our second annual student engagement survey. So you will be seeing in grades 8 through 12 comparative data um, between the 2021 survey and the 2022 survey. Um, knowing that there are some challenges with surveying elementary students, it took us a little longer to research and find a survey. But this fall, we did define a student engagement survey instrument for grades three through five, and that was administered for the first time um, this spring. And it is important to note that that survey was read to students so that their reading and comprehension did not um, detract from their ability to respond. When we think about a student engagement survey, we really divide engagement into three dimensions. So we start with behavioral engagement, which is the degree to which students are participating in activities within their school. And we move to the right around emotional engagement, and that um, describes how students feel about their interactions with, other, uh, with adults and their peers in their school. And then we close out with cognitive engagement, which is the degree to which students are investing in and owning their learning. So that's about their um, engagement within the direct learner experience. And so tonight you'll be getting a report on each of the dimensions at secondary and um, at the elementary level. We did want to share a couple of overall findings from grades 3 through 12. Um, 
We were excited to see that students were more engaged around areas related to career skill development and future planning, so they know the importance of that. We did notice two subgroups, our Asian and GT student groups, that reported higher levels of engagement across all dimensions. Um, we did notice as we look over time from grades 3 through 11 that student engagement does uh, decrease in all student groups as they grow through the educational system. Um, we noted that Hispanic students reported lower levels of engagement across all dimensions and that overall students reported gaps in the connection between their motivation towards future goals and the instruction that they were receiving. So at this time, I'm going to pass the um, presentation over to Dr. Tiffany Unruh. She is a coordinator in our strategic planning department, and she'll be sharing the details of the two reports. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So when we look at the secondary levels, we had approximately 23,000 students actually participate this year in the secondary survey. And this was out of our 4,909 students that we have in Fort Bend ISD in secondary grades. So when we look at this, this represented 86% of our eligible students to participate. And when we determine that eligibility, that's based on the enrollment verification where parents have actually permissioned, sorry, thank you, for students to participate in a variety of different surveys in the district. So what this really tells us when we think about the survey response in an online survey, a survey response of about 30% is actually considered very good. When we look at survey responses greater than 50%, that's actually considered an excellent survey response. One other thing we wanted to consider is thinking about the size of our district population. Where would we have the smallest margin of error in terms of looking at the student results? And for us to have a 1% margin of error based on our student population, we would have needed to sample approximately 7,000 students at the secondary level. So based on our responses this year, we clearly kind of met and exceeded those expectations. Um, one difference between the survey administration from this year and last year is in 2021, the student demographic information was actually self-reported by students. Ooh, excuse me. Um, and so what we did this year is we established some systems so that we were actually able to connect the um, student demographic information directly to Skyward so that we could get an accurate representation of the student demographics this year. Um, when we also think about our student groups, it is important to remember that students might be members of multiple groups. So we might have a student who's represented in our Asian group. They could also be represented in economically disadvantaged or even our English learners if they meet those different criteria. When we do talk about some of the comparison from last year, one thing to think about in the, our report is that we use the, the term EL for English learner. This is actually a term that TEA is transitioning to EB for emergent bilingual. Um, and for comparison purposes, we left that the same this year. But next year when we have the report, we'll actually make sure to match the TEA kind of explanation and requirements re regarding that. So as Stephanie mentioned, the, the secondary survey is adapted from the high school and middle school survey of student engagement. This um, survey has three different dimensions and it has eight factors divided between the emotional and the cognitive engagement categories. So when we look at these, in addition to these ones that are actually part of the calculated mean scores, there are some additional questions that provide us with some insights in terms of students' academic interests, as well as thinking about questions that we wanted to ask to include uh, about perceptions of things like AB block, CST walks, those types of uh, things as well. So as a student responds to a question, their response is assigned a value. So a student, if they say they strongly agree with the statement, that's assigned a value of four, for example. A student who agrees is assigned a value of three. So when we look at the responses across all these different questions, we're able to generate a mean score for that particular area. So on this slide, we can see the results from those three dimensions for this year's surveys, as well as the percent change in the mean score compared to last year. When we uh, look at these here, you can see that all of our dimension scores actually fall within the moderate range of our student engagement scale. So if you think about how uh, the um, scores from one to four are broken up, they're broken up into quartiles, and all of ours for all the dimensions and factors fell within that category. There is one other note to make as we think about what the change in the scores from 2021 to this year. Um, last year when students engaged in the survey, approximately 60% of the students were actually in the online learning model because at that point in time, we were running both online and face-to-face -face learning models. So as we transitioned this year, those students were all face-to-face, -face, so that was kind of a big uh, change that we saw and could explain some of the results that we saw in the differences with the mean scores as well. 
So overall, we did see increases in our behavioral engagement, really thinking about the fact that students were able to be back on campus this year. Uh, we could anticipate that students were able to more actively engage in different activities on campus. And then as I mentioned, with the transition with students coming back to the classroom, that could also explain the decrease that we saw in emotional engagement because students who were online were now having to relearn some of those social norms as they re-engaged with uh, work inside the classroom. So in the next few slides, what we're gonna do is we're gonna share some of the key highlights that we saw from those different areas. You'll notice in the PowerPoint, there's a box in the lower right-hand corner that references the different page numbers in the actual um, engagement reports if you're wanting to use that as a reference as we go through as well. So when we considered behavioral engagement, one of the key things that we think about with students in order for them to be engaged at school is they need to actually attend school. So when we looked at this here, one of the questions asked students, what is it that motivates you to go to school? And this, uh, this year, when students were asked that question, parents and friends actually increased as an influence on students as to why they go to school. So more students went to school because their parents or friends uh, wanted them to go or that they were excited to see their friends again. So that definitely connected back to um, the fact that students were back in the classroom. We also noticed that fewer students this year said that they were motivated by teachers to, to go to school. So that's definitely something to explore as we look at some of the different factors and see what are some of the reasons why students may have said that. Um, secondary students were also asked to describe how much time they spend in activities outside of the school day in school activities. And we actually saw one of the largest increases. The mean score actually increased by 49% compared to last year. Um, and actually, there was not a single student who actually reported spending less than an hour um, in activities outside of school this year. So that was huge compared to last year. When we look at emotional engagement, uh, with this particular dimension, we actually saw decreases in the actual overall, as well as all of the different factors, with the largest loss in the emotional engagement with the school. So this particular factor asked students questions about their feelings of being safe, uh, looking at the perceptions of rules and the fairness of those rules being enforced at school. It is important to note that even though we saw drops, all of the uh, dimensions and factors still fell within that moderate level of engagement. As we look at these, you'll notice that there are page references to the student engagement survey reports. And um, as you look at each of these pages, there's a summary and kind of description of each of those in there. So if you're interested in exploring those, that information is provided on the summary pages. And then again, the percent change here, in this case, because it's the overview, is looking at the percent change in the mean score uh, for these different areas. With some of the highlights for emotional engagement with secondary students, one of the things that we'll notice is that, uh, in general, we saw an overall drop in the emotional engagement for all students. But an exciting piece was is that we did see an increase in the number of students who felt that there was at least one adult who knew them well on campus. We saw an increase of 6.5% compared to last year. So that was pretty significant. You will notice some percentages on this slide here, and just as a difference compared to the last slide, is that these percentages represent the percent of students who responded a specific way for a question. So like that 6.5% increase means that there were 6.5% more students who selected agreed or strongly agreed with that particular question. When we look at how um, students felt about their environment, remember we said that the, in this particular area, this is where students were asked about whether they felt safe at school, whether they felt that the rules were uh, fair or that they were fairly enforced. And with those questions, we did see drops ranging from nine to 17% compared to last year. But again, as we think about these increases and decreases for individual questions, it is important to note that within all of the dimensions, including the emotional engagement with school, that these still remained in the moderate level uh, for this year's results. When we look at the cognitive engagement, again, we did see um, slight drops here, and these questions really focused on how students invested in their learning. Um, it represented the different factors that you can see here. And we saw increases in how students in, uh, increase their efforts in their academic pursuits, as well as their engagement with academic goals, future planning, and aspirations. So we saw increases there. And these slides, again, on a reference a percent change in the mean score. So this is looking at overall how those students performed. When we look at the individual details there, we um, can see that one of the things to highlight is that we saw an increase of four to five percent of students at, uh, that felt that they sometimes or often are able to speak to an adult about college and career goals. You know, this was a big emphasis that we had from last year's results that the secondary campuses really dove into and included in their improvement planning process. 
We saw large increases of over 10% in uh, secondary students who were sometimes or often able to engage in academic conversations or to work collaboratively with their peers and groups. We did see uh, small drops in the level of investment as students looked at what they were motivated by in their classroom. So when we asked students if they're excited or curious about the things that they learn, as a result, we saw drops with students um, as they were asked those questions. But 92% of our students did say that they agreed or strongly agreed that they go to school because they want to graduate and go to college. So we felt like that was a really positive piece with our um, secondary students. When we look at other academic areas, at the secondary level, more students felt that their campus emphasized participating in school events. So as students were able to come back, the campuses were placing that emphasis there. We did note that 83% of students reported sometimes or often being bored in class. And some of the big reasons that we, they reported for that was that the material wasn't interesting, the teacher methods were not interesting, or that they weren't allowed the opportunity to interact with classmates. We also noted an, a small increase in the number of students who've considered dropping out of school. Students were able to select from a list of reasons as to why they've considered dropping out of school. And the most common reasons were that they disliked their specific campus, they were not seeing the relevance of the content that they were learning, or they had a dislike of their specific teachers as the three primary reasons why they've considered it more. Uh, students also have the option to share whether they've considered transferring to another school. And students in their responses indicated that they do value the experience at a public school, as this was the most commonly selected school that they would transfer to if they had the choice to. We had over 7,000 students that shared an open-ended response with why they've considered transferring. Um, and the most common reasons that students shared were dealing with their school environment and relationships with teachers and other students. As we shift to the elementary students um, survey results, at this level, we had over 12,000 students participate. This represented 85% of the eligible students, and again, that eligible criteria being through the enrollment verification process, that parents permission for students to participate in surveys. That was out of the total of 16,000 students that we have here in Fort Bend. And again, you can see the comparison of the demographics of the students overall in elementary in grades three through five versus the students who were actually surveyed. Um, these, were, these numbers were very close and there were only slight differences where a few groups were um, slightly underrepresented in the overall surveyed data. When we look at the three different dimensions at the elementary level, the survey instrument, the student engagement instrument for elementary or SEI-E, uh, this includes both the emotional and cognitive engagement dimensions uh, as well as six factors within both of those. When we administered this survey, this was the one that was read to students to make sure that we didn't have reading uh, capability as a gap. But it also, a, one, a note to make here is that in the behavioral engagement, that was not an official part of the scored or the validated instrument. We included those pieces so that we could anecdotally compare the results from some of the questions that were uh, from the secondary level that we translated to, grades, to be appropriate for grades three through five. As we look at the overall scores, you can see that both for both emotional and cognitive engagement, those uh, scores actually fell in the high level of engagement for um, elementary level compared to the moderate level that the secondaries uh, were reported at. Elementary students in the behavioral engagement category were asked to describe the amount of time that they spend in various activities throughout the day um, and, or, and outside the school day. And at the elementary level, we could see that about 70% of students at the elementary level said that they spend less than an hour a week on homework. And over 40% are able to spend at least two hours participating in different clubs and activities outside the school day each week. In the emotional engagement dimension for elementary, you can see that overall we had um, the dimension scores and the factor scores fell within the moderate or high levels. So there were some that were higher than others. Uh, you will note also that some of the names for the emotional engagement factors are slightly different. This is because we did use a different instrument. So part of the selection process when we chose this tool was to look at which one was the most closely aligned with what the secondary students were asked. But there are slight differences such as the addition of the family support for learning, which is not included at the secondary level. When we look overall, elementary students responded very positively to most questions. So most questions had between 80 and 90% of students agreeing or strongly agreeing with the different questions that were asked. 
So when we were looking at the data here, we saw greater differences in the number of students who responded that they strongly agreed rather than the combination of both of those. We did note that 88% of elementary students reported that they felt like their teachers cared about them as a person, not just as a student. So that really resonated with the other response that we had where uh, the secondary students reported that there was at least an adult that knew them well on their campus. We had over 93% of the students that reported feeling supported by both their teachers and their parents. As Stephanie mentioned, we did see the trend continue at, um, at the elementary level where as the students progressed from grades three through five that we did see of the emotional engagement start to decrease as well. When we look at the overall cognitive engagement, there are only two factors um, in this particular dimension, and all of these, again, scored at that high engagement level. Um, and when we look at these, uh, the two that really highlighted and connected to the secondary were the future goals and aspirations and what motivated students to learn, what were the things that we could motivate them with. We saw, excuse me, overall, very high levels of cognitive engagement. Over 94% of uh, elementary students said they plan to go to college and 97% said that they feel that their school is important for them reaching their future goals. So we had noticed, or noted previously that there was a trend to decrease in student engagement as they progressed in grades three through 12. Um, but as we looked at this particular question asking students about their future goals and kind of connection to that, remember that we had 92% of secondary students who uh, said they were motivated to go to school to graduate and go to college. So even though overall we saw trends with the, uh, the engagement decreasing, uh, we did see that this level of interest in college and career planning stayed high throughout a student's um, career in Fort Bend ISD. At the elementary level, sorry, at the elementary level, we did note that the students placed the greatest emphasis on understanding information, uh, or they felt that their school, I'm sorry, placed the greatest emphasis on understanding information and using technology in the classroom. Um, many of the students felt that their school uh, strongly emphasized participating in school events um, and that they shared, the students themselves shared that they were most interested in engaging in classroom activities that use technology or that allowed them to work in groups. And then lastly, as we think about all of this data, um, the campuses and the district improvement planning process have been using this data to help us go through and figure out what are areas that we can improve on and what are steps that we can take. This will also be used with the department planning as we go through and, and that same process and look at what are the overall trends and what does it tell us that we'll be able to work on uh, next for students. So specific campuses were actually given their individualized results. So they have a report where it is specific to all of their students and what they said. Um, and with the purpose of, we wanna be able to guide conversations with campuses with our district leaders so that they're able to best make those adjustments. Um, and as well as to provide future voice opportunities for students to really tell us um, what they need and for us to continue to make improvement in student learning experiences in Fort Bend. And at this time, I think we'll take questions. Thank you very much for that report. Mrs. Hannon. Thank you, Mrs. Malone. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams. And my apologies, can you tell me your name again? Yes, it's uh, Tiffany Unruh. Say your last name again. Unruh. Unruh, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't write it down. Thank you, Ms. Unruh. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. I liked your last slide there where it says uh, this data could help us guide um, future student voice opportunities. And if you don't have this answer tonight, I would just, I would like the answer sometime. But looking at our special ed and our Hispanic um, information and the results on this, do we have a, a, a good representation in the student voices group of Hispanic and special ed students? I think that's a great question. We will need to follow up on that. I don't have the list of student okay. voices students, but we will follow up and let okay. you know. I would just, I would think it's important that, that we look <clears throat> at that demographic and if that demographic isn't um, representing that population well, that maybe we create a different, I'm, I'm, I'm not telling folks what to do, it's a question, but I, I do think it's important and I'm glad that, that you're gonna uh, use this as a tool. Um, I, I really want to say, <clears throat> first, before I ask some other questions, I am so encouraged that we are looking at student engagement data. And I know I was a little bit persistent um, back in 2021 when I asked for it, but I appreciate 
you listening. And I, I think it's just vital that we, we hear our kids and we hear uh, what they have to say. I think it's also interesting that we're going to have some trends to look at over time. I know last year was a bit of an anomaly, and so that, that da data might play in a little differently when we look at it longitudinally, but I still think uh, that information is valuable uh, as a comparison. Um, I want to thank whoever the, the board member was that asked about the um, percentages and the the because I wasn't understanding quite what it meant, what some of those numbers went, who was a, but I guess it was some kids couldn't participate in a survey. So that was very helpful to me. So thank you for asking that. Um, the, uh, the other question is, um, do any of our elementary students participate in any kind of student voice across the district? So that's just a follow up to the other one as far as our sub pops, but also our our grade levels. I think that would be important um, as well. <clears throat> so I have I just actually have a couple of notes because later tonight we're we're going to be voting on the board the uh, superintendent evaluation instrument and and board new board goals. But um, as I'm thinking about those and thinking ahead to September with the campus improvement planning. There are some things that may not be represented in the, the, the KPIs that I think are important. Like here, when we're looking at the emotional domain, um, that's not the weakest results as far as what I'm looking at. Like when, when, I, when I looked through there, I looked and, and really saw actually the cognitive domain <clears throat> had some of the lowest um, engagement scores. <clears throat> and specifically about the, the perception of academic challenge. Um, and I was glad that the, the career and college readiness conversations increased, but they're still quite low. And so to me, one thing that I really hope I can see in campus improvement planning when those documents come to the board is thinking about... Um, how interested those elementary kids were in, in, in what they're doing and it prepares them for college or careers and that that went along, right? They, they held that through secondary. But then when we looked at the secondary data, 50% um, or more of the students still said they rarely or never talk about career goals or how to apply to college. And for those babies, that don't have a parent or guardian that can have that conversation, um, that's a conversation that we have to have at school. And, you know, teachers are rock stars. They, they, they are who make it happen, and our counselors too. And I understand that our student-counselor ratio makes that very, very hard. But I really, I guess these aren't questions, but I really look forward in September to seeing how that plays out in, in our... Um, campus strategic plans. Um, the only other real question I have about the data was there, there was one question on the elementary that I didn't see on the middle school, but it was about anxiety. And so that question didn't appear on the, that it, was there one that was similar? The, the question was simply, I, fe I feel anxious at school or I feel anxiety when I come to school for the elementary. Was there a companion? Not precisely, but when you look at the emotional engagement with the school, that's where it had questions asking about things like that they cared about their school or they felt like their opinions were respected. Um, the anxiety question specifically was not included in the secondary okay. survey. I just thought that was a really interesting question and the, the percentage of kids that answered that they, that they do feel um, an anxious. So anyway, again, thank you to all the staff that that looked at this data and, and made this happen. And thank you for finding a companion for the elementary that, that kind of gives us a, a, a little bit of an apples to apples comparison. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Dr. Gilliam. And thank you for uh, the explanation, Ms. Tiffany. Dr. Unruh, yes. Dr. Unruh, um, I, I apologize. Um, First of all, I, I just have uh, two questions. The first is when I'm looking at the defining student engagement, I think that's like on the second, uh, the second page, 
where Asian and GT student groups reported higher levels of engagement across all dimensions. Of course, the first thing we think is why, but of course, it's intrinsic motivation and, and what have you. So I'm just going to take that question, for example, and going into the others, are there conversations behind how do we take whatever's there and, and looking at the intrinsic motivation, and not just this question, just different questions and with our findings? So how are we processing our findings? Because I think this is very, it's, it's very clear. I understood it very well. And I believe the campus is well. So I'm looking for, okay, so I see the next steps. And then I'm thinking of timelines. And then how do you pull it all together? How does this look going into the new year? Oh, I'll, I'll start that one. Okay. Um, the first thing that we've done with both the campus planning groups and the district planning group is to provide them the surveys like we did with you. And these findings that you see here were actually generated by district staff after reviewing the surveys. So we're asking them to look for trends. And then we ask our campus staff to think about a trend and how that played out in their own individual data before they look at their performance objectives and the evidence that they would provide about improvement next year. So um, I believe that campuses received their individual reports at the, the first week of June in their first CIP training, and they've begun to process that, and we are having open labs throughout to support them in looking at that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Mr. Hamilton. Yeah, thank you for all the hard work that went into this. Um, I know a lot of these, uh, not a lot of this information is not where any of us want it to be, and just, um, I, I think it, it, it is helpful. We, we want to have that honest look in the mirror uh, so that we know where we need to make improvements. And so I know we're, we're all committed to making those improvements. Uh, but just wanted to ask, um, so in the actual survey data, uh, the campus breakdown, um, I, I know there, I, I think it would be worth somehow focusing in on that and just noticing that uh, we have some, especially specifically, I mean, the, um, the question of have you ever considered transferring from this school? Uh, the campuses that have very high percentages there, I know uh, we, we need to focus on fixing those problems. And I think we also, also should, uh, should do things to celebrate the ones that are on the bottom of that list that are doing a, a great job where, you know, uh, there are several where, you know, in the high 80s percent want to stay at that campus. And I think we, we should celebrate that uh, even as we try to address the ones where uh, almost half of those students uh, are seriously considering or wish they could be at a different school, basically. Um, so just thank you for the information. And, and I, know, uh, I know we're all committed to, to moving forward and addressing those. So. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Now, this is a great report. This is amazing. Just looking through all this data and just kind of going through it. One of the things that, that I did notice also was the, the decrease in the Hispanic in, in engagement overall. But some of the things that, that I sort of picked out with emotional engagement being lower and students um, feeling more uh, wanting to more percentage of students so say they would consider dropping out. Um, I wonder what correlation that is with, with overall, or also feeling safe at school. More students say they, they feel unsafe. And a couple of those things make me think of some of the issues we've had in the past with, with discipline. And I, I know there's been a lot of uh, the, the bullying situation. But I also wonder, when we go back to the question, have you ever considered transferring from this school and the, and the campuses that sit at the top of the list as, as being often or sometimes they've considered it. Uh, what what does the engagement look like uh, in terms of campus activities? Is there fewer campus activities? Is there is there parents less engaged there? Is the community less engaged? I know one of the one of the goals that, that we're going to uh, vote on as far as our board goals is as a whole getting more parental involvement, more community support for for uh, our schools and. and uh, the phrase, it takes a village, comes to mind, and it's one of the things that we're really trying to work a lot harder on. Uh, as our dad's clubs, as our PTOs, um, boosters, some of these schools that where they may have that higher percentage, you know, what does that, what does that look like? Is there a correlation? I'm just going to be curious to see kind of what that looks like and, and 
that will give me or give us an idea like how if we can address it in, in some of those areas as well. So, but overall, this is this is amazing, very extensive report. Is this report the entirety of it uh, published on the on the website as well, or just the the PowerPoint? It's this report is not yet published but, on but our strategic be. planning. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, and. Thank you, Ms. Williams and Ms. Henry for your extensive report. Um, great job. I just have a couple things as well. And they kind of touched on it regard, regarding transfers. And my main thing thinking about that, well, first of all, let's, let's focus on the positive. 49% increase in involvement of students outside the school day. Hallelujah. Praise you. God, thank you to all of you guys for your hard work in engaging our students because we know um, that studies show that kids who engage in extracurricular activities have higher indicators of school success and SAT scores and beyond. So hats off to all of you for that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And I know that the proof will be in the pudding in, in the future for that. So thank you. And then the 7,000 students who said that they um, responded about potentially transferring. So I guess the main reason I want to point this out is to kind of, this is our opportunity to, to discuss as a board. Um, and it concerns me because I'm thinking about our, our budget and I'm thinking about the loss of students in prior years. And again, I'm so grateful that, that we have um, now met the low growth scenario from PASA and that we're, we're trending upward, but at the same time, there's work to do. And I think dissecting that information in those 7,000 students, and as I look at the list, I'm not surprised by the ones that are at the, the leaderboard there. Um, which is weighs heavy on my heart. And I, I guess what I'm asking for all of us to consider is thinking about what can we do to change that and, and how do we create options? Because you said something really specific and it was um, that those students were concerned with their school environment, so safety or bullying, you name it, right? just having a positive environment. And then secondly, they mentioned not only with their relationships with students, but also teachers. So again, I think of climate and culture, which I know Dr. Whitbeck, um, you have already began improving the climate and culture in Fort Bend ISD. And that's through the help of, of all of you and, and our amazing um, staff. So I, I really appreciate that. However, I want to just make sure that we focus on those schools that have a heavy percentage of folks who are considering elsewhere and that they know that we matter, when we, not we matter, they matter, excuse me, and that we value them and we're trying to do everything to improve the climate and culture and academic success rates there as well. Thank you, though, for all of your work. And that sums, oh, Dr. Gilliam has another comment. I, I do, and, and considering about culture and climate, so I'm going to be very careful in how I address this question. So uh, I'm going to address it to Dr. Whitbeck, not necessarily a question. When we're looking at culture and climate, Dr. Whitbeck, I think it would be uh, beneficial uh, to actually find out why the students want to leave. There, many times, it could just be GT students that are at a school that they don't have the best AP teacher in the district, okay? <laughs> There's tons of them. Uh, there are ton I sh When I say tons, there are several, I would say, hundred, hundreds of kids that are uh, found, they're zoned to one school, and they know very well that that AP English 4 teacher is sitting at another campus that can help them get that five. And so there are so many other issues that are going on rather than just discipline. I understand discipline. So climate and culture is, is not necessarily the discipline. It's, it's also 
just feeling that they belong there, that I walk onto this campus and I just really feel good. I can be an A student and I'm participating and I'm in the drill team or I'm a cheerleader, but I still don't feel like I belong here for whatever reason. So, um, and so again, Dr. Whitbeck, I'm not necessarily, I'm handing it to you, I'm talking to you, so I'm not talking to uh, anyone to do something, but I believe it would be uh, very beneficial to us to find out what are the causes. I don't know how to do that, but I'm sure that there's somebody that does. Thank you. And th thank you again for the presentation. I do agree with uh, Mr. Garcia. It was, as I was going through it, if I had a question, I was able to get the answer right in the document. So thank you, that's huge. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Oh. And we're gonna move on to our next information item which is Facilities Master Plan Update, Policy FC Local. Yes, ma'am, thank you. We're gonna get this loaded up real quick. Take your time. So in accordance with policy, FC Local, the administration will provide the annual update of the facilities master plan. The purpose of this presentation is to provide the board an update to the original 24, uh, 2014 facilities master plan recommendations approved by the board. The facility master plan includes an update on progress toward implementing each recommendation previously approved by the board and includes recommendations to construct new schools, draw new attendance boundaries and develop new instructional programs that would improve achievement and increase utilization or underutilization in schools. Previously, the facility master plan included a new elementary school to relieve Palmer Elementary and Parks Elementary, which was included in the 2018 bond program. The most recent demographic projections so show that the school will not be necessary in the near future. Based on these revised projections, Staff recommended postponing the construction of Elementary 52 and the board approved transferring funds from Elementary 52 to cover the cost for construction Ferguson Elementary, Elementary 54. Ferguson Elementary in the Siena community is under construction to relieve Heritage Rose, Leonetti, and Siena Crossing Elementary Schools. Ferguson Elementary is scheduled to open in the fall of 2023. Following board policy FC local, the SBOC will engage in boundary work in the fall of 2022 with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration by February of 2023. Elementary School 56, a new build or an expansion and renovation of Ferndale Henry is scheduled to open fall of 2025. Staff is working with a developer to identify a site for elementary school 56 or a future elementary school. Staff recommends utilizing program contingency for the purchase of the land and including budget for design and construction for elementary school 56 or an expansion and renovation of Ferndale Henry in a future bond election. To continue managing overutilization in this region, staff will continue to cap and overflow enrollment from Heritage Rose Elementary to Scanlon Oaks Elementary and Siena Crossing Elementary to Schiff Elementary. The School Boundary Oversight Committee will engage in boundary work by the fall of 2024 with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration in February of 2025. A new middle school is necessary to relieve Baines, Lake Olympia, and our Thornton Middle Schools. Funding for the purchase of land and the design of Middle School 16 was included in the 2018 bond program Staff recommends including the construction budget in a future bond election. Middle School 16 is scheduled to open in the fall of 2025 and the SBOC will engage in boundary work by the fall of 24 with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration by February 2025. The opening of Alameda Crawford High School, the district's 12th high school is projected to open fall of 2023. It will balance enrollment between Crawford, Hightower, and Ridgepoint High Schools. The SBOC will engage in boundary work in the fall of 2022 
with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration by February of 2023. Staff will continue to manage overutilization at Rich Point High School through the continuation of cap and overflow from Rich Point High School and Hightower High School. A new elementary school, ES55, is necessary in the Harvest Green area to address growth in the Travis High School feeder pattern. Staff worked with the developer and identified a site for the elementary school. During the May 2022 board meeting, the board approved the use of Bond 28 contingency for the purchase of the property. Staff recommends including the budget for design and construction for the elementary school in a future bond election. Elementary School 55 is scheduled to open in the fall of 2025. The SBOC will engage in boundary work by the fall of 2023 with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration by February of 2024. The Willow Ridge Feeder Pattern Early Literacy Center, or ELC, located at Richmond Elementary School began a phased implementation in 2018-2019. It initially included full Im implementation serving pre-K through first grade for all elementary schools in the Willow Ridge High School feeder pattern in 2022-23. However, due to the pandemic and stakeholder feedback, the administration will engage with the community during the 22-23 school year to determine next steps for the ELC programming in both Willow Ridge and Marshall feeder patterns. The Hunter Glen, Hunter's Glen ELC and the Marshall Feeder Pattern opened in August of 2021 with an initial cohort of early childhood special education and pre-kindergarten students. Enrollment for kindergarten and first grade cohorts was initially planned for the 2022-23 and 2023-24 school years. Respectively, however, due to the pandemic and stakeholder feedback, the expansion is paused pending community feedback during the 2022 2023 school year. To address student uh, uh, needs, a new natatorium and transportation facility are necessary and planned to be constructed on district-owned property. Providing a third natatorium will increase program capacity and reduce travel time. The addition of a transportation facility will improve service and greatly reduce deadhead mileage, thus saving on fuel expenses. In order to address our aging schools, a rebuild of Clements High School is necessary and planned for a future bond. To address aging facilities with high facility condition index, a rebuild of one elementary school in the Willow Ridge High School feeder pattern and one elementary school in the Bush High School feeder pattern is planned. Staff recommends funds for design and construction of the facilities be included in a future bond. At this time, the administration plans to recommend a future bond election. However, staff understands the importance of fully considering all recommendations based on the overall economic situation at that time. A delay of the bond election could affect the timeline for certain projects suggested by this plan. It is expected that the administration will engage in boundary work with the School Boundary Oversight Committee in the fall of 2022 with recommended boundaries presented to the board for consideration in February of 23. Public hearings will also be scheduled around that time as part of the community engagement process. And at this time, uh, we'll entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Ms. Malone. I'm glad to see that the, uh, there's a new natatorium in here is being recommended for a new construction. I think the community will appreciate that very much. Um, I had some questions in regards to the SBOC. I know that we're going to be starting pretty soon on boundaries. I know that there's currently open enrollment for uh, taking new members of the SBOC. Uh, when does that close? Yes, sir. I'll take that one. So the application window opened on June 10th and closes July 9th. And the intention is to um, review, of course, all of the applications extensively and bring to the board for consideration the list of membership by September. That's taking into consideration the vacations and summer schedule and ramping up for school that we have so that we can launch that work early fall. And I would also like to point out, Mr. Garcia, to your question that um, as much 
boundary work that we can do that is feasible in relation to a bond or a future bond. Um, you'll notice in some of the instances we said by a certain date, and that's because when we are able to look at boundaries for a whole area when a new school is coming on that may impact other schools, we want to be able to do that with the School Boundary Oversight Committee. So you, you might notice some dates that may say by um, February of 2024, and if we were able to incorporate that in the boundary work initially, then we would do that, that, that launches this fall. Yes, ma'am, thank you. No, the SBOC, very important work. I, I think it's important and in, to be mindful that if we don't get the applications of people in those feeder patterns, especially for the schools that we're determining boundaries on it, I think even if, if that window closes and we don't have members in there, we should probably do what we can to reach out to the community through the principals and make sure that we're engaging those parents, let them know that there's a new school coming in your area. If there's any members interested, we'd love to have their participation. So uh, I, I think make, making sure that representation is, is important for that. Um, I know we talked about this before, but in, in regards to a, a, a bond, uh, we can, the district can absorb a, a, a bond without having to increase the tax rate currently. Um, and I think that's important for the public to know because especially in the times, in the economic times that we're in, what is the, do you know what current construction costs are currently averaging on, on new construction? I think I was, I was at this, the conference and I was hearing somewhere between 400 to $450 a square foot, which whereas a, like a year ago it was like somewhere in the $200 range. Mm -hmm. Is that? Uh, we're not seeing prices that high okay. uh, at this point. We have a lot of data from the 14 and the 18 bond and then also uh, data that we're absorbing and then uh, putting some escalation cost. It has gone up but I have not seen any, any pricing in that range. Okay. And no, that's all. I, I appreciate the update. Very, very well done. And um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Ms. Hannon. Thank you, Mrs. Malone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Perez, for that update. I just have a couple of questions, um, really one, I guess, around the early childhood centers. I just want to be clear. So for the, my first question is, all of the elementary schools in the Willow Ridge and Marshall High School feeder pattern will have pre-K next year. Is that, is that correct? Or is that incorrect? The question was, if all of the... Are, are, it, will pre-K, so here, let me rephrase it. So will the pre-K at Hunters Glen and Ridgemont remain? Yes, that is correct. They will remain. So, so currently there won't be any changes to the configuration at the early literacy centers at Ridgemont and Hunters Glen. Okay, so and, just for pre-K. Yeah, so we, we still will have pre-K, K and one, in those early literacy centers. Okay, but since the kinder and the first grade aren't, so the current pre-K kids that are moving up to a kindergartner, they're all returning to their home campus. Is that correct? No. No, okay, so that's, I, I'm. Yeah, so, so what's happening is the way that we have implemented the early literacy centers at Hunters Glen and Ridgemont what we're doing is we're continuing as is. What we were pausing on was the expansion, which would then lead to us possibly having to do some boundary changes <laughs> for Ridgemont, because we were gonna have all of the students in that feeder pattern. Then at the early literacy, early literacy center, coming from their home campuses. So now we're not gonna be requiring that to take place for those families. So they were required to, to go in, but now we're pausing on that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my original questions. Do all of the elementary schools in the Willow Ridge and Marshall feeder pattern have pre-kindergarten? So currently all of the elementary schools in the Marshall and Willow Ridge feeder pattern don't have it at their home campus. Okay. So we have it at some of the sites, and then we have it at the Early Literacy Center. So for example, in Marshall Feeder Pattern, Jones Elementary, they don't have a, a pre-K at their campus. Okay. 
so that those students would be going to Hunter's Glen for the pre-K program. Okay, and, and I'm sorry to, to be a little slow. And the kids who are, let's, let's say, E.A. Jones, uh, that were at uh, the ELC last year as a pre-K student, they will go to the early uh, childhood center for kinder, or they so, will go back to Jones? So they would be able to stay in the program. As I understand it, they'll be able to stay in the program right now. So if they were to opt out and return back to their campus, is what you're asking? Yes, that is exactly what I'm okay. asking. Right now, I don't believe that they would be required to, so they could stay at the Early Literacy Center in the program, and if, if they wanted to opt out and come back to their home campus, is what you're asking? Yes. Okay. I don't know for sure. I can get you that answer, though. Okay. I. Because I don't want to convolute my response with some of the other right. inner workers. Right, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to ask that, and I, that I didn't ask it earlier, um, but actually I didn't consider it until I, I just heard it. And so I just, I, as we're sort of pausing it, I just wanted to be clear in my mind where are those kids and what are their options. So thank you, Dr. Mensa. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Malone. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Dr. Gilliam? Okay, so I have a, a question uh, piggybacking on uh, Ms. Hannon. So we're pausing. Can, we, can you explain what that pausing is so I'm not just assuming something? Sure. So initially at the Ridgemont ELC, we, were, we had plans to expand the Ridgemont Early Literacy Center so that that would include a possible rezoning for all of those students within the Willow Ridge Elementary, those Willow Ridge Elementary schools, those four elementary schools. So we engaged in feedback because we weren't prepared to continue to expand the program and that's when we paused it. So now we don't have all of the students who were in that feeder pattern required to go to the early literacy center because then it would continue to grow based off of enrollment. So that was where we paused. And that was gonna happen, we were gonna initiate that process this last fall through the SBOC to bring for a possible recommendation for rezoning and that would have impacted the elementary schools in that area. So we paused that process because we wanted to continue to get feedback to see what we were gonna do in the future with the early literacy, early literacy programs based off of feedback from the community, staff as well to see if we needed to go in that direction. Okay, and then what's happening at Hunter? There seems to be um, conversation Okay, I'm just going to say it. Is uh, so Willow Ridge has Ridgemont, Marshall has Hunters Glen. That's Is that correct. appropriate. So to say Will it that way. Yeah, Willow Ridge has Ridgemont, which they had a standalone. They have a standalone site, an early literacy center, is what they what we have at the Ridgemont facility. At Hunters Glen, we have the program at one campus within. So you have the grade levels that are configured with the staff in inside the same building at Hunter's Glen. And at Ridgemont, it was a little bit different because we have two sites. We have the Ridgemont Elementary Campus site, and then we had the Early Literacy site. So based off of the enrollment for the entire feeder pattern, if we were to continue with the model of having uh, the two teachers, one classroom, and expand for that site, we would occupy the entire space and it would it continue to grow because we would have more students in the program. So with the, the opt-in to the program and requiring students all from that feeder pattern to go in, that would increase the number of pre-K K through one students who are at a site. So if we pause, then we can continue to evaluate whether or not we're gonna continue with this program and we're also able to manage the enrollment at each of the sites so that that was really impacting the Ridgemont Early Literacy Center, and it would potentially start to impact uh, Hunter's Glen Early Literacy Center because it was in the sharing the same space in one building. If I might just add in a little bit more information, uh, although you excellent job, thank you, Dr. Mensa. Uh, 
upon arriving here, as the team began to explain to me the process and what had happened as we uh, developed the early literacy centers, I had a lot of questions, and um, they did a great job of explaining to me. And in that same time period, we began to get some parent feedback that uh, some parents don't like their children in two different schools, like one for the very young age and then a brother or sister in a fourth or fifth grade. They would rather have their children in one school, one building. Uh, and then we also, we've had um, some really great things. Uh, I don't think there's much uh, uh, question about the instructional piece, but um, we've had questions about really more the grade level configuration at the schools. So we also learned that that really in terms of rezoning, because of needing to make room, that communication had not happened since prior to pandemic. And so we were very concerned to suddenly put out a communication in the spring that, oh, by the way, we told you two years ago, but you're going to go to another school. And that's that's hard. So that's where our team really talked it through and decided we better pause we better see what the community wants, what the staff is telling us, and what the data is telling us about how the children are progressing. So those are really the main things, staff, parents, and data. But we'll be bringing you a recommendation next year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gilliam, and thank you, Dr. Whitbeck, for your clarification. Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Perez, thank you for that very helpful update. And I want to commend Dr. Whitbeck and the staff, um, just since I've been on the board, uh, looking into the financial situation of the district in general. I, I, know you, I know there's been a lot of hard work on trying to clear up some difficult situations with the budget situation and the bond planning in the midst of the economic situation that we're in with inflation as high as it is and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I've, I'm, I've been very impressed with, with the hard work and the dedication that I've seen. Um, and so there was something within that that I've seen. I think the best way to do this is to put it out there as a question. Uh, so let me start with a statement. So uh, we, I, I, as a taxpayer, I don't get to vote directly on when the federal government spends a huge amount of money, and I don't get to vote directly on when the state government gets, is, is going to spend a huge amount of money. And so as a taxpayer, there have been times where I've voted against a local bond, bond election kind of purely out of principle because I don't get to vote on... And I, and I think the government in general spends too much money. And so I'm kind of taking it out on the local government when it's really I'm, I'm mad about how much money the federal government, state government spending. And so from just from my perspective, I'm I'm looking closely at the district finances and, I, and I've been very impressed with what I've seen. So that's kind of the background. So within that, um, the, the process of the funds that were not included in, in previous bonds uh, because, you know, from, from an effort of fiscal responsibility and also just the process of trying to limit the dollar amount of the bond this time has been very encouraging to me. And so I guess can, can you kind of speak to that uh, for those taxpayers like me who might be on the fence about whether or not they, they would vote for a bond? <clears throat> yes, sir, I can. So. The one thing I think we all understand is that the need is always greater than the means. And uh, so we understand that. So we've, you know, ever since uh, we went ahead and did the facilities and condition assessment and we put pricing behind every line item on that, we, we came up with an amount. Uh, we know that that's not the amount that we want to bring forward to a voter. So then what we, we do is we start by utilizing, utilizing a lot of different tools, one of them being facility condition index and everything, prioritizing what's going to be able to come forth and, and what's what's not. And then at the same time, we've heard loud and clear from this board that, you know, we need to also look at, you know, can we expand? That's, you know, kind of like we're talking about Ferndale Henry. Can we utilize a building, expand on it to save money? And, and the answer is yes, it saves quite a bit. So we're, we're looking at those uh, things. Uh, you know, on the, on the land side, the one uh, thing that I want to, you know, caution is that we, when... The demographic information tells us we need land in a certain area. It, we definitely don't want to bypass it if it becomes available and it's at the right price. Because if we bypass it, literally developers will jump on it immediately and then it's not going to be available. We, we've seen that in the past. So those are all the, the different things that we kind of look at. Uh, and 
we're, we're getting close to the dollar amount that we will we'll be bringing forward. We had a, a really good meeting with the, uh, the bond planning committee. We're going to have another one uh, on the 30th. And this time around, we're going to actually uh, have it at Lakeview Elementary because one of the uh, things that when we spoke about it in, in uh, renovations and rebuilds, they said we'd like to actually go and see a school that was rebuilt. And so we're, we're looking at having the meeting there. Uh, but they're, you know, they're also engaged and they throw a lot of hard questions at us. So we've been, you know, just providing a lot of information to them. And, uh, you know, eventually we'll be bringing it to you all. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. All right. Speaking of uh, Mr. Perez, you mentioned pricing and that it sounds like you have pricing for these different items. For example, let's say the natatorium or a new build, et cetera. Is that some information that you could share with the board? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but yes, I mean, that's information we could share. Okay. I think that would be helpful. So if, if we could get that sometime uh, this week, I would appreciate it. Also, on the prior bonds, how much do we still have outstanding or unrecognized? So we, uh, in the 2014 bond, we have a little over uh, 13 million. Uh, but, you know, we have earmarked that uh, in amount for the, the final uh, wing of the CTC Center. Uh, you know, depending on, once again, we're, we're looking, you know, working with Dr. Whitbeck, we're looking at different options. Uh, if we do not do a standalone, you know, building and we go into an existing space, we can save quite a bit of money, you know, in, in that arena. Uh, but we have a little over 13 million. And then in the 2018, uh, at this point, we have, well, I don't have it right in front of me, but we we're, I believe it's close to about 200 million, but there's a lot of uncommitted at that point. So in other words, as we go through a project, the same way that, uh, you know, Brian and on his side doesn't sell all the bonds, we don't issue all the POs until such time that we need to issue. And so there's, you know, quite a bit of, of that that is not issued at this point, but we do have a little over seven million in program contingency. You, uh, I think I've told you before, we started off with five million and then as we finish projects where we, we know and we feel comfortable, we're not gonna have to expend additional, then we put that into program. We've come to the board in numerous situations and asked to, to pull some out, but at this point, we're a little over seven million in program contingency. Yeah, and that's great when you over budget and spend, spend less than budget. We, we love when that happens, so thank you for that. Um, the only thing I, I want to mention and point out is if we have over $200 million, and we're just going to call it $200 million for an easy number, but it's 200 plus the 13, so over that, right? Out of $992.6 million of a bond, that's roughly 20%. So we still have from 2014 and 2018, 20% funds remaining for projects. Yes, ma'am, but once again, I wanna clarify that those are committed funds. So in other words, we just haven't paid those out. So there's, you know, let's talk about high school 12. We have all the FF&E that has to come in, you know, at the end, we haven't paid, you know, for any of that. So all of these projects have uncommitted, I mean, there's committed funds that are showing on the books, but, they're not going to be there at the end of the project. We're, we're going to we're going to be under, because we came in under. But we're not going to be under two hundred million. Right, but we have two hundred million dollars in construction projects outstanding, right? Correct. That they've been committed yet not recognized. Correct. So I just want to point that out to everyone, so we are clear yes. on that. But I do think, with regard to to knowing that and then also just getting the pricing for the various items that, that you're considering, it would be helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez, as always. Thank you. Okay, and then we're going to move along to our consent agenda. And I wanna point out that um, item D is going to be removed and pulled from the consent agenda initially because it needs to be a um, action item and then we'll move along back to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion for item D please? I move that item D be moved to 
An action item? Is that what you're asking, Ms. Malone? No, just a, a motion for consideration of item D. Okay, are we considering it now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I move that uh, the board consider item D under the consent agenda. Do we have a second? A second. Okay. All right. Item D, consider approval of the 2022-23 budgets for the General Fund, Debt Service Fund, and Child Nutrition Fund. Please vote. Or do we have any discussion? Danetta? No. Okay. Seeing no discussion, please vote. Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Can, yes, okay. 6-4, no against, the motion carries. Okay, now we will be moving to the consent agenda. Do we have any items that need to be pulled from the consent agenda? Yes, Mrs. Malone, may I please pull um, consent agenda item 9B and 9K? Any other items? Okay, I need a motion to move. I move the consent agenda be approved with the exception of 9B and 9K. I second. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda, consent agenda item with the exception of items 9B and 9K. Do we have, please vote. I'm um, no. Ms. Williams? I'm um, no. No, okay. Five, four, one against, the motion carries. All right, moving along to item 9B. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Malone. Um, I'm just getting on the right page here. Um, so I just had a question regarding... Ms. Hannah, we need a motion oh, I beg for your 9B, pardon. please. I move um, to approve consent agenda item 9B. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, we have a motion to um, consider our item 9B, consider approval of 2021 and 2022 final budget amendment. Do we have any discussion? Yes, Mrs. Malone, I just have um, a couple of questions, and um, I know I sent these questions in a little bit late, and I didn't see the response. I know that some of the funds that for school leadership um, had to do with TRS, correct? Um, and then, um, or, or I... I'm not recalling exactly. You gave me an answer last week. But I guess, did some of this include changing, like, the budget code or the function to in, for coach stipends to instruction? Brian, I see you. Or, I'm sorry. Mr. Gwen, I see you shaking your head. Yes, ma'am. And so related to those functions, we have moved some of the coaching stipends out of function 11 into co-curricular, which is function 36. That accounts for some of that move. I think you also ask about the transportation costs in function 36, which is co-curricular. And in there, about $380,000 are transportation charges related to fine arts and another 476000 for athletics. So that was a, a driver of some of that increase there. Also, at it's we 
we have a little bit of a dance each year in fine arts and athletics with relation to when they order their their supplies. They place the orders in late spring, anticipating that they will get them next fiscal year, but in some cases they may come in in the current fiscal year. So we also make sure the budget has sufficient capacity that in the event that we receive those items in June prior to the close of the fiscal year, we're able to record them without causing that particular function to go over. So that's also contributing to some of that increase in co-curricular. Okay. Okay, and again, I, I just mentioned that as we are in a tight budget situation for next year, I, I, that's why I asked, because I'm, I'm really glad we realized savings in all the other accounts, so please know I'm seeing those too. But um, so is that a typical thing that we're going over like three quarters of a million on transportation? Every, is that an, a usual Situation? Well, I, so the short answer is no, that's not unusual because the the projection that we do for the year-end budget is not necessarily perfectly aligned with what we estimate it will be. And again, that's to ensure that we're in compliance with the TEA uh, policy that says that the budget will be balanced by our, we won't exceed the budget in any one function. And because of the timing of one of these, some of these expenditures come in, we try to make sure that those are lined up. If it doesn't occur in the current year, that means it happens next year. But if it does happen this year, we want to make sure we have the capacity there. And I, I think that that answers the question. I think one other question that you asked was specifically related to our major maintenance area or some of the major areas that we saw there and if those would be recurring. And looking at the expenditures that we saw this year, a number of those expenditures would be bond contingency eligible. So as an example, chillers were replaced, or a chiller was replaced at a campus, that would be something that's bond eligible. We had some elevator maintenance and repairs that was done, that would likely be bond contingency as well. And so, although I would say that yes, those expenditures could come next year, or could occur again next year, we would be utilizing bond contingency as opposed to general funds going forward to make sure that we maintain our financial flexibility in the general fund. Okay, because if we didn't, we would, we may go under the 90 day <laughs> fund balance and when you we, add those up. It is tight, but what I would say it just, and I want to remind everyone this, since the budget has been officially adopted, we are planning to use $27 million of ESSER next year, and that will ensure that we have a 90 day fund balance. Now, that precludes there being some completely horrific event occurring next year, and in which case, if that were to occur, what I would say, we would likely, likely see either state or federal funds that would assist us with that. But for the general operating budget, the ESSER funds, barring the non-passage or the decision not to call a TRE, the, the, the ESSER funds will allow us to function within our 90-day fund balance okay. policy. Okay. Do you have any wood out there that you can knock on <laughs> since you put that out in the universe? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gwynn. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Mr. Garcia. And you said that we're using ESSER funds to balance the budget for this year. Now, next year, we won't have that money. So is it safe to assume that if, if we don't pass the TRE this November, we have no ESSER funds for next year, then that puts us below the 90-day fund balance, and then that puts us in a situation where we have to go back and cut more programs and cut more from the budget? Is that... Is that an accurate statement? Yes, sir, that is an accurate statement. And then if we go below 90-day fund balance, that affects our credit rating as well. Is that correct? That has the potential to affect our credit ratings. What the rating agencies would look at is if we go below 90 days, does the board and have we put into place a process to bring ourselves back to 90 days? And so it's more the adherence to our fiscal policies than it is actually having the 90 days. So if we were to go for multiple years without a 90 day fund balance reserve as is on our policy, and we've said nothing about how we're going to address that shortfall, then they would look at our commitment to our fiscal policies and likely downgrade our rating. And I don't, support at all going below a 90-day fund balance. I'm I kind of channeling my inner Jim Rice up here, and I'm with him 100% on that, and we've talked at length about that before. So um, I just wanted to kind of point that out. If, if we, and I, I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to end up doing, but November we put a, a TRE on the ballot, uh, and we don't 
get that passed, it'll put the district in a difficult situation. Now, we can only put a TRE in November. We can't put it in May, correct? That is correct. Although the statute does not specify it has to be in November, it says a uniform election date. The timing with which we receive the, calc the information to do what's called the maximum compressed rate calculations, that timing of that is in August. And so the only way to call the election or to have the election is when you receive that information. Since it occurs in August, there's no way to have that election in May. Okay. And we've also Understood. checked, well, could you use the calculations from the prior year to hold an election in May? And the answer to that question is no. The way they've written it is specific to you have to use it for the tax year into which you are calling the tax election. And so Understood. they've confined us to November without stating it specifically. I understand. I understand. Well, that's all I had. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And I think you guys bring up you know, a really good point as far as um, the TRE, and if that were to not, if, if it were to fail, there is significant concern over that. So what I, what I would say is, and, and I agree with all of what you said, the other component, though, is revenue. And there is a way to get some more revenue, and the revenue is get kids back in our schools. So whatever we can do to increase our revenue and increase enrollment, we need to be focused on that because I would hate to see the aftermath effects of a TRE failure in, in our district. So we've got some work to do, um, most certainly. And increase attendance. Attendance S. is a huge piece to that puzzle of the revenue, not just the enrollment, but the percentage. We were at about a 96.5% historically prior to COVID, and then now we're at more like 93.5. Would that be accurate? Okay, so so big difference. So we've got we've got to get the children we have back in class. <laughs> yes, that very good point. Attendance and enrollment. Let's get them going. And on that note. We have a motion. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> we have nine nine B on the table. Consider approval of twenty one twenty two final budget amendment. We have had a motion and a second. It is now time to vote. Miss Williams. Yes. Yes. All right. We have a seven zero vote, folks. Next, <laughs> next item is going to be 9K, consider approval of endorsement of a candidate to represent Region 4 position G as director on the Texas Association of School Boards of Directors. We need a motion. I move to approve consent agenda item 9K. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion? Yes. Dr. Gilliam? Yes. I would like to nominate Trustee Angie Hannon as the TASB board candidate to fulfill the large region director seat for Fort Bend ISD, which will be voted on at the delegate assembly in September. TASB board, board nominations call for capable, experienced school board members who can assist in providing a, the association with outstanding leadership. Trustee Hannon's time on this board, leadership has time on this board, leadership in education, and a heart for supporting teachers and students in public schools makes her well-suited to fill the Fort Bend ISD director seat on the TASB board. Trustee Hannon is an active member of TASB and has been consistent in her attendance at the TASB convention and leadership institutes. She was an alternate at last year's TASB delegate assembly and is currently on the TASB legislative advocacy committee and serves as a member of the mental health subcommittee. Trustee Hannon has regularly attended in the Gulf Coast Area School Board Association meetings held online and at Region 4. She also has attended the National School Boards Association Legislative Advocacy, Advocacy Institute virtually in 2021, as well as in person in Washington, D.C. in 2022. Trustee Hannon will represent us with the integrity and humility and will devote the time required to fulfill this obligation. Again, I would like to nominate Trustee Angie Hannon for this position. 
Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Trustee Hannon, or Ms. Hannon. Thank you, Mrs. Malone, and thank you, Dr. Gilliam, for that nomination. <clears throat> I just want to add to that. I know that I mentioned this during the board agenda review last week that I wanted to throw my name in the hat for this, <clears throat> but I wanted to expand a little bit on why. And so um, as um, someone uh, pre-trustee, pre um, I had some questions about TASB. Um, but since I have been on this board, while I don't agree 100%, and I think not many of us agree on many things 100%, I do absolutely see that TASB plays a vital role in uh, the function of school boards. Um, you know, I support TASB and organizations like the Texas Caucus of Black School uh, board members. Um, I support TASA. I think all of those <clears throat> types of organizations help us with legal aspects to improve the way we are able to govern. Um, <clears throat> they help us with our legal policy uh, and rolling those out um, to our district. And um, one of the most important things that I think TASB does that maybe the public doesn't realize is they really help um, school districts, the thousand um, school districts <clears throat> across the state, <clears throat> excuse me, have a collective voice <clears throat> to the state, state legislature, excuse me. <clears throat> And um, <clears throat> I think that legislative <clears throat> advocacy agenda is so important. So I know that this board member helps do the business of the board, <clears throat> but I also know they work on the legislative advocacy that TASB does on our behalf. And for instance, one of those is ballot language honesty. That is going to be one of the items that they will be advocating for <clears throat> school boards this year. Uh, with the legislature, not to mention student health, uh, staff health, teacher recruitment and retention, school finance, school accountability, uh, the issue in front of us with charters and vouchers. Um, but anyway, I do hope and I ask this full board uh, to support um, the nomination that's on the table. And um, I will certainly do my best to, to bring information back and take information forward. Um, to, to represent our district. Thank you, Mrs. Malone. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. So I want to point out that I too had some interest in this, although I didn't speak. I think Judy was trying to speak. Is she? Judy was trying to speak. Uh, Yes, Ms. Day. Hi, Ms. Malone. No, actually, uh, because last time when I was uh, online and my I had some difficulty for internet connection. So I, I was just about to ask, is there anybody else? I know I heard Ms. Hannon um, was being nominated by Dr. Gillam. I just wondering if there's any other uh, board member was their name is uh, on the floor. So I think you were, you were just about to talk. So please continue. Thank you. Yes, I, I too had interest in serving on, on the TASB board, um, as did I on the legislative committee. And I'm super glad that you um, got to, that you are serving Fort Bend on the legislative committee currently. Um, and that Dr. Gilliam, that you've been our, our delegate. So thank you for for that. I also believe in public education, and I have understood that TASB is a conduit to that to, within the state legislator, Slater, and that it plays, it does play a vital impact. And the reason I didn't mention anything last week is because I wanted to process in my own mind, this came very fast, on the time commitment and dedication that it would take and the requirements. And after doing so, I do, I want, and also I didn't want to just say something that I could not commit to. So with that, um, that I would like 
consideration as well. And that I believe that I understand Fort Bend ISD, that I grew up here, that I have kids in this district, that I know massive amounts of um, folks who work for Fort Bend ISD, and have also had um, eight nieces and nephews. So I understand our district from a youth all the way to today and now serving on this board and believe that I would be able to share Fort Bend and its diversity um, and just the, the messages and what we're trying to do here and advocating in the state legislature to support public education. And one thing that's really passionate and dear to my heart with, especially while we're talking about budgets, is the funding. And we've got to do something about the funding with public education. And whether it's you or I, I hope that is a huge priority. Or whoever else has interest. Is it, if anyone else has interest, please feel free to share. Yes, Ms. Day. So um, if I understand correctly, so now we have two uh, board members are interested to represent for Band SD. First, first of all, I want to thank you both for willing to put into actual time and energy to serving on the TSB uh, board as a director. So uh, I, I did read uh, all the documents actually uh, and I considered it, I thought about it very carefully, uh, especially I understand uh, the person from our board actually is gonna replace um, Mr. Wright's position, which actually is a big shoe to fill, right? With the experience and all that. So um, my position after I hear both Ms. Hannah and Ms. Malone, um, I really feel if our board president is willing to serve for this role, and especially if Ms. Malone believe uh, she has the time, uh, she can, she is willing to make the time commitment. Uh, so I wanted to support Ms. Malone. So I guess I will nomi nominate Ms. Malone to to be the our representative for the TSB board director director position, sorry. Yeah, but I want to thank you both uh, for, wait, for waiting needs to serve. Thank you, Ms. Day. Dr. Gilliam? I'm going to choose my words very carefully. We are a board. We have um, been in training since the moment I got here. And I have heard over and over about a team of eight. And I'm a little bit disappointed that we have two candidates up right now, or two, two but that, that is democracy. And I will once again, I stand in support of Ms. Hannon because of her commitment to the task. When I read the board activity report, I believe 80% of those things that I read, she is there and present. And I can't say that, and I'm not gonna say what our other trustees do. I just know that every time I'm there, I'm, it may be the two of us, it may be four of us, but Ms. Hannon is there. Something else I'd like to say, and I, I understand, I would love to be on the TASB. In fact, I was approached at one time uh, prior to the election. And, um, but I do understand. I think it is time for us to share responsibilities so that we can be focused, that we have someone who is specializing in one thing and someone who's specializing in the other. Um, However, a vote is a vote, and the way that it comes out is the way that it comes out. But for us to be a team of eight, 
we have to be very careful and considerate of each of our team members. Team is together, everyone achieves more. And I want us to truly begin to, to work with the team of eight and to consider each and every one and what they bring to the table. And I thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Ms. Williams? Um, I'm gonna choose my words nicely as well. However, uh, I am so grateful for Christian willing to step up. I think she would be the perfect cho uh, person to fill uh, Jim Rice's shoes. I like the fact that she um, enjoys working with the entire board and she didn't, you know, get into clicks. So I'm extremely proud of Christian. I'm, and she has two young children in the district. She has a vested interest. So I'm ecstatic. I can't wait to cast my vote for Christian Malone to uh, go to TASB and make us all proud. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Do we have any other discussion? Seeing none, I believe it's time to vote. I'm a yes. For item, well, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> item 9K, consider approval of endorsement. We have a nomination for Ms. Angie Hannon to be the candidate to represent Region 4, Position G, as director on the Texas Association of School Board of Directors. Do we have... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. You want to say that again? You made a motion? Yes, I made a motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second for Miss Angie Hannon um, for consideration of approval of endorsement of a candidate to represent Region 4, Position G, as Director of Texas Association of School Board of Directors. Please vote. Um, no. We have two fours, three against, and one abstention. I did abstain. That was Judy, Judy and Donetta both voted, voted against. I, I was the abstention. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was me. Okay, item K, consider approval of endorsement of a candidate to represent Region 4, Position G, nomination of Kristen Malone. Do we have a motion? I move uh, the board to vote for Ms. Malone for the TASB director position. Second. We have a motion and, and a second for consideration of the approval of endorsement of Kristen Malone to represent Region 4 Position G as a director on the Texas Association of School Board of Directors. Please vote. I'm a yes. We have four fours, one against, and one abstention. The motion carries. Can I ask a question? So I say point of clarification, right? So I think Judy. Sorry, I think Judy voted with her thumbs up or down each time. Did you count her? You did? I, I did. I was the abstention, though. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, Ms. Malone. The vote was 4-1-1. One, one. Could was you? Was it 5? I, I, I think it was 5-1-1. One, one. Oh, okay. 5-1-1. One, one. Thank you. And thank you. We will now convene in closed session under Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, under the following sections. Section 551.071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law. Section 551.072, consider purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. Section 551.074, personnel matters. Section 551.076, security matters. Section 551.082, student discipline matter or complaint, or section 551.0821, personally identifiable information about public school student. The time is 8.21 p.m., and we are now convened in closed session.
reconvene in open session. There are actions to consider from the closed session items. Do we have any motions? I motion, I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation and appoint Erica Price to the position of Director of STEM Curriculum and Instruction. Do we have a second? Second. Sorry. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Seeing that there is no discussion, please vote. Yes. Six, four, zero against, the motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Yes. I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation and appoint Tiffany Ireland as Director of Child Nutrition. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Yes. The vote is six, zero. The motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Yes. I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation and appoint Linda Corbin to the position of Director of Literacy, Curriculum, and Instruction. Do we have a second? Second. A second. We have a motion by Ms. Hannon and a second by Mr. Garcia. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Yes. Six, four, zero against. The motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees accept superintendent's recommendation and appoint Kobe Wilbanks as Associate General Counsel and Executive Director of Legal Services. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Garcia and a second by Mr. Hamilton. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. I'm a no. Five, four, one against, the motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Yes, I move the Board of Trustees accept the superintendent's recommendation and appoint Christopher Smith as Director, Multimedia Communication Strategy. I second. We have a motion by Ms. Hannon and a second by Dr. Gilliam. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Yes. Six, four, zero against, the motion carries. Do we have any other motions? Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees to approve the purchase of 16 plus or minus acres of real property adjacent to Siena Lakes Drive, utilizing either 2014 or 2018 program contingency funds, and authorize the superintendent to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate any agreements and closing documents necessary for the purchase. I second. We have a motion by Mr. Hamilton and a second by Dr. Gilliam. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Yes. The motion carries six, four, zero against. You wanted to address. Um, Madam President, item D. Uh, does not technically um, require board approval for a head football coach, athletic coordinator at the campus level, but I appreciate the board's um, discussion, and we look forward to welcoming Troy Degar from Houston Independent School District to be um, football coach, head athletic director at Kempner High School. Thank you, Dr. Whitbeck, for that. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. The time is now 9.26 p.m., and we are adjourned. <laughs>